a great game, golf. In all sport, there's nothing to beat the sensation of hitting that ball fair and square and feeling it fly cleanly off the club. Not even drenching rain can spoil the pleasure for the members of the golf section of the B and W Renfrew Club. There are times, of course, when a golf ball seems to have a wicked will of its own. At other times, the credit is entirely ours. What's in a golf ball? Much more than you think. From the moulded paste centre outwards, the modern golf ball is a precision job. Watch how it is done in the Dunbop factory at Speak. The soft paste centres are frozen hard and before they can thaw out and lose their shape, they are pressed between two sheets of raw rubber. In this way, each centre receives a rubber skin which is then cured by a heat process. The moulded cores, previously frozen, are now passing to the other extreme of temperature. Heat is applied to the press in the form of steam. Steam? That touches a familiar cord. The look of that pipework. The boiler house. The chain grate stokers. What does all this add up to? That's right, Babcock boilers. Seven of them. But like good golfers, we must keep our eye on the ball. Here the core is being covered with a winding of rubber tape kept at a steady tension and evenly distributed. For this process, the core has once again been frozen to hardness to prevent distortion. Meanwhile, the gutta percha shell for the outer casing has been prepared and its two halves carefully checked and weighed. The fixing and curing of the outer shell is completed in a second set of steam presses. The protruding flash left round the joint of the two half shells is ground off and as the rubber would be difficult to grind in its resilient state, the ball is frozen hard for the third time. At every stage, the balls are tested and checked. Their vital statistics confirmed, these beauty queens now go for their makeup. Each receives four separate coats of paint. The name is added, the surface polished, one more inspection made, and the queen of the lynx steps out in all her glory. A final mechanical checkover. A deft wrapping, and she's ready for the shot. Soon there will come the great day when, full of hope, some golfer will pay her his addresses. Eye on the ball, and away! <laughs> Power stations in Britain are burning 40 million tonnes of coal a year and this demand is rapidly increasing. It is vital to the nation with its limited coal resources to obtain the maximum power from every tonne of coal. One of the most important steps in achieving this has been the development by B&W of the cyclone furnace for the firing of large boilers. The cyclone is in effect a giant cylindrical burner in which crushed coal, borne by a swirling stream of air, is burnt at a very high temperature, the resultant hot gases passing into the boiler. The temperature is high enough to melt the ash which flows out of the furnace into a water-filled tank in which it is quenched to an easily removable granular slag that is a useful by-product. The construction of a cyclone furnace involves great skill and accuracy in bending, fitting and welding together its complex system of water tubes. Each cyclone is built at the Renfrew Works as a complete unit. On site, it is fitted over a circular opening or throat in the boiler wall.
there may be a number of cyclones to a boiler, depending on its size. Behind this story of design and development of the cyclone lies a continuous program of research and testing at the B&W Renfrew Laboratories to determine the characteristics of many different coals and their suitability for cyclone firing. This program includes tests under full-scale conditions in a cyclone installed at Renfrew Works and in experimental pilot scale units in the research laboratories. Despite rapid developments in the field of atomic energy, coal will be, for many years to come, a major source of power, and the cyclone furnace has an important part to play in making the most efficient use of the world's coal resources. at B&W will know what is going on in their community, the Staff Association publishes its own magazine, The Circulator, whose editor, Mr. Banyard, tours the departments to pick up stories. What news, for instance, has Tom Goodman to give him? Tom is secretary of the Renfrew Tennis Section. Mr. Banyard will want to know how the season is going and whether any young players are shaping well. In addition, the club secretaries report on their activities and at a conference in London, the contents of the next issue are discussed. On this occasion, Mr. Laverton, secretary of the staff association, was present with Mr. Gill from Renfrew and Mr. Jones of Oldbury. It is the personal touch that brings a journal like this to life. While gathering news of social events, the editor is always on the watch for stories of Babcock and Wilcox personalities. In a recent issue, Mr. Guthrie, superintendent of the plating shop, was, to the delight of all at Renfrew, featured in a story of his life. A new number is taking shape. Text and illustrations are assembled in consultation with the printer, represented by young John Cheney. The final text and layout are passed to the composing room of Cheney's printing works at Banbury. The type is set and cast on monotype machines. Meanwhile, the headings of larger type are handset by the compositor in his composing stick and transferred carefully to the column in which they belong. These columns of type and the blocks that will illustrate them are arranged in page formation on a smooth surface called the stone and locked together in the form. After the correction of proofs by the editor, the form goes to the press for printing. An average issue has some 40 pages and eight pages at a time are printed on one large sheet of paper. The printed sheets are transferred to the folding machine. The single sheet, as it comes off the press, is a seeming jumble of pages, some one way up and some the other. But there's a method in it, and it all comes right in the folding. The folded sheets and the cover are assembled and bound together in a stapling machine. The edges of the folds are cut away, leaving the pages free for turning. The job is done. A new issue of 9,000 copies is ready for distribution to the Babcock community throughout the world.
Here she comes, the holiday special to take B and W families for their holidays at Blackpool and Morecambe. Maureen, Kathleen, and Anne Marie had better hurry if they want to catch that train. Soon they are mixing with the cheerful crowds on the platform. Oh, you'll have a quiet time, you people left behind, with half Renfrew heading for Blackpool and the sea. It's a long journey, so make yourselves comfortable. Some choose cards to pass the time. But it's comics for the girl. Sweets from the sweet. Once upon a time, there was a king. But some daft they trumped him. Keep your kings and queens, I prefer my pipe. Over the border and running through the English countryside, some dream with their eyes wide open, some with mouths wide open. Some take it easy, some just travel unconscious, and some wouldn't miss a minute of it. We're drawing into Blackpool. Your holiday is all ahead of you. Make for the sea, you little one. There's room for you all between here and Ireland. Dressed or undressed, what does it matter? When you're tired of the sea, there's always the donkeys. The taxi was good, the train was better. The donkeys are best of all. The weather, well, it does have its moments. If you're lucky, you can sit still and brown off. Or, if you're browned off with sitting still, you can play beach ball. When the time comes, you'll be ready for a nice scream. The spirit of carnival has caught Mrs. Carmichael. She won't go a step further without one of those colourful beach hats. Oh, suits you, my dear, says Mr. Carmichael, but leave me out. The holiday spirit gets them all in the end. Old or young, there's no resisting the magic of Blackpool. Dusk falls, the lights blaze up, the night is young.